So I want to talk to you about word learning um, in young sequential bilinguals. And it has to do, of course, with the mystery of language acquisition. How is it that children learn language? It's a magic trick that they do that we've all done. Um, and language acquisition has always been an entrancing topic to both linguists and psychologists. And it's also the stage at which they face off. I mean, models of uh, both linguists of language and, psych and psycholinguistics uh, challenge each other on their stand on language acquisition. So, uh, what have we thought about this? This is sort of a quick and dirty thing. So, in the beginning of the, f in, in the first half of the 20th century, the idea was that children learn by imitating, right? And then, in the second half of the 20th century, the idea was that the language acquisition device just needs input to set parameters, and then universal grammar emerges. Um, in the beginning of the 21st century, the thinking is um, a little bit different, and of course I've oversimplified, right? <laughs> Nobody understands. Um, the idea is that children learn language as a way to join the group that they were born into, and to create shared representations of the world by chunking and predicting meaning from a variety of sources. And one of the representatives of this, these kinds of models, of course, is Thomas Sowell. So most of these models, except maybe not Tom Sell, but all, most all the models try to represent the acquisition of a single first language. Even though this, as um, Joshua told us, this uh, situation is quite rare in the world. There are many different combinations of the acquisition and learning of multiple languages. Uh, simultaneous early multilingualism, early sequential multilingualism, late second language learning, and so on and so on. We give them names. And there are um, idiosyncratic combinations, as there are as many as there are bilinguals, obviously. Um, and these have all been treated as special cases, even though that this is the most common situation in the world. So it's not clear whether there's a standard process where we have a child acquiring a single native language in a monolingual environment and that the others are special cases, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, theories of language acquisition have to allow for these cases for simultaneous and sequential acquisition at different levels of proficiency, at different times during um, life. And this, added to this, are the issues of the effects of literacy on linguistic functions and the acquisition of literacy in languages in which proficiency is variable. Half the children in the world go to school in a non-native language. Okay? So we were talking about learning to read and reading to learn. And language wasn't there. What language are you reading? What language are you learning? Um, and of course deaf signers are always reading a second language in which they're not very proficient. So this is the context of our study, of what we wanted to do. How can we describe a system that allows for the acquisition of multiple languages with different levels of proficiency? And what are the factors that could be relevant? Obviously, there's age of acquisition, proficiency, the manner of acquisition, the patterns of language use, the typo typological relations among the languages. Is someone bilingual in English and Japanese, or English and Spanish? Social, the social linguistic context, and of course, there's individual differences. So, the linguistic inf situation in Israel is complex and, lucky for us, allows us to test, um, to, to do natural experiments that wouldn't um, happen in other places. For example, we can compare bilinguals with different levels of proficiency where one language is the name, the second language of one group is the native language of the other group, and vice versa. Um, we can also compare bilinguals with monolinguals with a minimal difference in, in uh, culture because we have, because they're all living in the same country. So we have monolingual groups and bilingual groups with different relations between their languages. The specific question that we examined in this study had to do with is this, is how does a bilingual educational environment affect the development of metalinguistic awareness in novel word learning. And what we did is we used, um, or we worked with um, 
kindergartens from the Arabic Hebrew bilingual schools, where we have two groups. We have a group, a group of children whose name, home language is Hebrew and they're acquiring Arabic, and a group of children whose home language is Arabic and they're acquiring Hebrew. And then we could also compare them with kindergartners who are going to monolingual Hebrew-speaking schools and monolingual Arabic-speaking schools. We use tasks that measure metalinguistic abilities. We looked at phonological sensitivity. We looked at the ability to do morphological manipulation and fast mapping. Um, that is, learning meanings of novel words. And that's the data. These are the data that I'm going to tell you about today the fast mapping data. So what is it about vocabulary? What is um, fast mapping? It's one of the mechanisms by which children and adults acquire new vocabulary. Okay, And the idea is that you acquire the label for a novel object after only one or a very few uh, exposures. The effects of bilingualism on this process are equivocal. In adults, it's been found that childhood bilingualism results in an advantage over monolingual adults. So if we take adults and we give them a fast mapping test, those adults who, were bilingual, who are bilingual from childhood do better in this task than adults who grew up monolingual. Um, in babies, some researchers suggest that the processes are similar in monolingual and bilingual babies, but that they're slower in the bilingual babies. Um, and some suggest with people who've done, looked at slightly older children that they use different heuristics for monolinguals. That children who are, who are growing up in a bilingual environment use different heuristics to learn new words rather than children who are growing up in a monolingual environment. But no one's looked at the effects of the degree of bilingualism or the type of bilingualism um, and how these can affect these abilities. So we looked at this process in our young emergent sequential bilinguals who are at different stages of acquisition in their two languages. So all these children are five or six years old, they're experts in their home language, okay? None of them had linguistic, had, had language difficulties. They had acquired, they're acquiring their very advanced levels of acquisition of their home language. And they've been um, exposed to their second language for approximately nine months. So they started the school year in September, and we measured and we tested them in May and June. Okay, so so you can't really they don't really speak the other language, but they've been exposed to the other language um, for nine months, and that's why we call them emergent bilinguals. Okay, so the stimuli were um, eighteen pictures of weird fruit and weird animals. Um, that the children were uh, unfamiliar with, and we get, we made up names for these fruits and uh, animals, and the and one of the, the trick of our experiment is that we manipulated the phonotactics of these names. So some of the words ha followed the phonotactics of Hebrew, okay, like Gavas and Malban. Some of the words followed the phonotactics of Arabic, like Khanfu and Ba'uf, and other ones were sort of not relevant, they, they weren't specific to either one, like Bongo or Yota, they, they, we called them the neutral phonotactics, phonotactics. So why are phonotactics interesting here? And one reason is that we know that young, very young children are sensitive to the phonotactic patterns in the la of the languages that are spoken around them. And we also know that bilingual, from these beautiful um, uh, experiments on, um, I think, Catalan Spanish um, bilingual babies, where monolingual babies will pay more attention to a language that sounds like the language that is spoken around them, whereas bilingual babies will pay more attention to a language that sounds different from the languages that are spoken around them. Mm. But monolingual and bilingual babies pay different kinds of attention to phonotactics. And we wanted to know whether this would affect the fast mapping process. So um, what we did is we had 18 stimuli, and that's a lot for 
kindergartners. We did it in three different sessions, and in each session, they learned six new words. Um, two of them, two of them, two in each of the phonotactic categories, and uh, one fruit, and you know, one fruit, one vegetable. We kind of balanced everything. Right. So in the first stage, um, the children were shown the words in the in the uh, picture of the object. In the second stage, they were asked to identify, uh, show me the malban, okay? And in the third stage, they were um, asked to produce the name. So what is this? You point to something and they had to tell us the name. Um, and these are the data. So in the identification task, um, so what we have here is we have a, oh wow, this looks different. Okay. So here are the, bi the bilinguals with Arabic is L1. Here are the bilinguals with Hebrew is L1. These are the monolingual Arabic speakers, and these are the monolingual Hebrew speakers, and the X axis looked a lot better on my computer. Sorry. So the thing that's important to see here, I think, is, and the thing that we took that surprised us, is that that children whose home language is Arabic did worse when the words followed the phonotactics of Arabic. Okay? So it's not the stimuli themselves because we can see that the children whose home language was Hebrew did fine with these words. The black histogram on the Arabic like stimuli. Okay? So it's not the words themselves. And it's not the children themselves, because we can see, at least with the bilinguals, that they did fine when, the, when these novel words followed the phonotactics of Hebrew or were neutral. There was something specific about the phonotactics of Arabic that resulted in the fact that they performed worse with these stimuli. In the production task, everybody uh, performed worse, and that's, that's a known thing. Children do, everybody knows, right, that children identify much earlier than they can produce, and um, th those are, have actually been um, shown to be two different processes, and um, we can see that. And the only main effect was the main effect of group, and um, where the bilinguals did better than the monolinguals overall. And we can see, and the bilinguals only differed from each other in the Hebrew-like uh, uh, stimuli. What I want to talk about are their identification data, because I think those are the most interesting. So, oh, and we also remember measured morphological abilities and phonological abilities. So what we wanted to do is to see how these are related. So um, what we did is we used a regression analysis to try to predict fast mapping scores from the phonology and morphology tests. Now we had different phonology and morphology tests, obviously for Hebrew and Arabic. And what we found, and I'll talk about this a little more at the end, is that of the children who knew Hebrew, that is the two bilingual groups and the monolingual Hebrew speaking group, um, the, their tests in the Hebrew morphology, um, excuse me, their scores in the Hebrew morphology test predicted, best predicted, their fast mapping abilities. And of the children who knew Arabic, it was, which is the two bilingual groups and the monolingual Arabic group, it was their phonological scores that best predicted their fast mapping ability. And we can talk about why this might be in a little bit. So, okay, so to summarize, the bilinguals performed better or as well as the monolinguals. That is, Bilingualism, first of all, did not show us a disadvantage, and if any case, it showed us, and, and if anything, it showed us an advantage. The Arabic-speaking children perform worse when the non-words sound like Arabic, and we believe that this is a result of deglossia. When Arabic speakers hear in real, in their real life, okay, when they hear a, a, a novel label, it may be in fuzha, it may be in literary Arabic, in modern standard Arabic. And because Fusha is the language of religious texts, it's treated with much respect, and linguistic errors are always corrected. When someone makes a mistake in Fusha, they are always corrected. And we know 
that literate adult speakers are often hesitant to speak Fusha themselves. I mean, an anecdote that I have is we have a professor, he's emeritus now, uh, in the Arabic uh, language, literature and language uh, department at Haifa University, who said, in my class, we only speak Fusha. And all of the students who were native Arabic speakers and were studying Arabic language and literature sat in his class with their mouth closed. <laughs> they were afraid to talk. This is common, and I've sort of tried to do like a little field study and ask people. In general, literate adults are hesitant to speak Fusha. So we speculate, and this is a speculation obviously, that for Arabic-speaking kindergartners who are made aware of the difference between the language they speak, which is spoken Arabic, and Fusha, and whose experience with novel words is usually in the context of Fusha, Word learning is, is a more controlled and monitored process than in other languages. Thus, it may be that when the Arabic speakers were presented with novel words that followed the phonotactics of Arabic, fast mapping processes may have been less efficient than when the stimuli followed different phonotactic rules. This is obviously a speculation. We're now doing, doing using the same stimuli exactly with adults. And it will be very interesting to see whether adult Arabic speakers also learn the Arabic sounding, the, the, the nonsense words that sound like Arabic less well than the ones that sound like Hebrew or like another language. We don't know this. So uh, about the differences in morphology, uh, and uh, so morphological skills predicted the fast mapping performance of children who knew Hebrew, and phonological skills predicted the fast mapping performance of the children who know Arabic. And we think that this is because of the differences in morphological complexity between Arabic and spoken Arabic and Hebrew. Spoken Arabic is more complex morphologically than Hebrew, and it may be the case, and this is again a speculation, it needs to be tested, uh, that um, in Hebrew, these children, these five, five and six-year-olds, have pretty good mastery of morphology. And they can use this ability in their word learning uh, process. Whereas in Arabic, they're still working on morphology. They're still acquiring basic morphological um, uh, categories. And it may be that what we see is the effects of the phonological abilities rather than morphological. They don't show up when they're learning new words. So it's not clear, um, and this needs to be examined more closely. So to conclude, we're trying to describe parts of the linguistic faculty in a way that doesn't idealize it. In the real world, the linguistic ability of humans has to deal with multiple systems, and sometimes in multiple modalities, and in, at different developmental stages. People learn to read languages when, they, when their knowledge of that language is maybe at different levels. We show that exposure to another typologically similar, and this has to be emphasized, language does not hinder mental linguistic development in kindergarten, and in some cases it can actually confer an advantage. And for the future, it's important to see how these abilities relate to the acquisition of literacy. And we did follow these children to um, first grade and to how they're learning um, to read both Hebrew and Arabic. And uh, I'll tell you about that next year. <laughs> um, uh, it's important to examine the importance of typological, sim of typological similarities because it's a very big uh, controversy in the, in the literature right now whether typological similarity makes a difference or not. We know, for example, that in terms of semantic access, if we have homophones, whether they're written in the same script or a different script in the two languages, really does not make a difference. You, can act, you, you, you access the translation equivalent of the homophone even though it may be written in a different script. So we don't, So at least in terms of the topology of the orthography, we know that doesn't make a difference. It's not clear how it's related to the topology of the languages themselves. And we, can, we have plans to test this by looking at Russian Hebrew bilingual schools and see because Russian and Hebrew really are not topologically related, and whereas Hebrew and Arabic obviously are. There are many, many cognates. 
So our data support the hypothesis that language acquisition includes pattern recognition processes and creative combination of these patterns in both monolingual and bilingual situations. based on my own intuitions, 
which has to do with people being hesitant to speak Fuscha, or people when they know that they have to speak Fuscha, of stopping and being very controlled in their speech. Their speech is not spontaneous. And so it may be the case that all linguistic functions are different in Fuscha than even in Hebrew, which is also a second language, or in English, which is also a second language, just because it doesn't have the connotations that Fuscha does. Yeah? Always spoken. All the tests, the phonological and the morphological, were always in the child's native language in, your spoke, in spoken Arabic. It was always inflectional. Yeah, it was always, yeah, they were always inflectional. Um, and we actually, well, those, those, those data are submitted now in a paper, so it should be out soon. Yeah.